Well, it happened again. And I'm not talking about having a lump on my nose right before I need to record. That happens all the time. I walked into my local junk store last Saturday, looked down, and right there in front of me was a device I've been searching for on eBay for a year, maybe longer, uh, but I never expected to actually see one in person. And yet, there it was, new in box, or close enough, like it was put there just for me to find. Uh, it's from the year 2000, because of course it is. I mean, have you seen my channel before? Uh, and it was made by a long dead company called, well, all the logos are covered up here. Uh, there we go. Dig Media, Dig Media, I'm not sure which one's correct and both feel pretty weird. I'm gonna go with Dig Media. The thing itself is also pretty weird. Uh, I think it's the first product, or nearly so, in a market that's existed for over 20 years at this point. It's still around, but most people probably have never paid any attention to it. Uh, and it's also a pretty unusual entry in the early MP3 player market, or more accurately, it's two of them. See, if we take a look on the box here, there's actually two gadgets. The bigger one is the Music Store, which is actually the name on the box, although you can't quite see it under the clearance sticker. This is actually an MP3 player. It's a stationary rather than a portable one, which is a variety that I think most of us never knew existed, um, or at least we don't care if it does. And then there's a second gadget plugged into the top of it. That's a far more conventional portable MP3 player called the Soulmate. And that's the part that's been giving me trouble. See, these were actually sold as separate products, as you can see here on the back. It says the Soulmate was sold separately. But honestly, they're supposed to go together. Like, they don't really make sense uh, separately, so I didn't really wanna just get one. Uh, but I could only find part A on eBay, the big boy. I've never come across anybody selling a Soulmate until now. And as the sticker in the corner tells us, this is a combo pack that was sold with the Soulmate. So it came with the little guy originally, and since I think the previous owner either never used it, or only used it maybe once, and then carefully packed it all back up, maybe hoping to return or resell it, the Soulmate is in fact present. So I finally have the entire system. You mean it's complete? Okay, well, not really. Uh, there's actually a third component uh, to this ecosystem that doesn't even get mentioned on the box, and that one's total unobtainium. I don't expect to ever find one. I don't think they ever sold one. Uh, but fortunately, it's also completely useless nowadays, for reasons I'll get into, so we're not missing much. But it is a bummer, if I'm honest, because if you look at Dig Media's whole system in the context of the era, it's actually pretty neat. Uh, and even this specific product is pretty neat. It's a little surprising it didn't seem to go anywhere, even at a time when the personal audio market was ripe for innovation. Because yeah, by the time this thing came out, the MP3 revolution was already occurring. Uh, this thing wasn't first to market by any means. But let's talk about what problems MP3s had not yet solved. If you've watched any amount of retro electronics YouTube, you'll know that prior to the 2010s, portable music players were one of the biggest consumer electronics markets. And I think that's mostly because anything else you could conceivably do on the move was pretty awkward. I mean, there were a few companies that nipped and tugged at the idea of personal video players and portable web terminals. And of course, there were hundreds of PDAs, some very successful within their niches, but very little of it escaped being early adopter stuff, even decades into it all. Even PDAs didn't really integrate into most people's lives, and very few portable gadgets really did until modern smartphones put every imaginable capability into the same pocketable slab. Portable music, on the other hand, integrated into millions of people's lives instantly upon the release of the first Walkman in 1979. I mean, even before that, pocket transistor radios were incredibly popular, but Sony's portable cassette player let you choose what music you wanted to listen to, and it was so small that you could have it on you all day long, no matter where you were or what you were doing, and that's exactly what tons of people did. But as convenient as it was, the Walkman sparked a whole industry that spent the next 30 years trying to figure out how to make a clone that was smaller, higher capacity, better quality, more convenient, cheaper, or all the above. And they had their work cut out for them because for the most part, you just couldn't get all of those at once. Not even most of them, really. Not even when the MP3 player came out. This subject has, of course, been covered in great depth on YouTube because MP3 players utterly changed how people listen to music on the go, particularly when the iPod came out and put our whole music collections in our pockets. 
But that didn't happen right away. Uh, it's generally agreed upon that the Diamond Rio PMP300 was the first commercially successful MP3 player, but that came out in 1998, four years before the iPod. So it took a while to get the formula right. In fact, by some people's measures, the iPod didn't even take over the market for another couple years, but that's getting a little too nitpicky for me. The Rio was impressive in a gadgety kind of way. It had no moving parts. It was smaller than a CD player. It was very cool. But in the cold light of day, that is, you know, retrospectively from 2022, it wasn't necessarily any better than a CD player, and it was maybe kind of worse. I mean, we can debate the aural quality of MP3s, especially since the Rio couldn't play anything better than 128 kilobits, which many people would say is unlistenable. But of course, we also know the majority of people can't tell the difference or don't care. Otherwise, the MP3 revolution never would have happened, since that bitrate was pretty common for most of the 2000s. The things that really matter to people are convenience and practicality, and the Rio kinda didn't have either one. It used flash memory for storage, which was extremely expensive, so at release it only held 32 megabytes. Even at 128 kilobits, that's only about two thirds of a typical CD. You could cut the bit rate down to fit a whole hour onto it, but at that point, even the average listener would probably notice the degraded audio. You could also add storage, but a 32 meg flash card was about $200 at the time, roughly the same price as the player itself. And even worse, you still had to fill that all up. With a CD player, if you wanted to switch music, you just grabbed what you wanted and popped it in the device. But you couldn't do that with the Rio. It had to be plugged into your PC to populate the internal memory, and while you could swap out memory cards, they were way too expensive. You couldn't just keep a bunch around with different albums on them. It cost you literally $1,000. So basically, whenever you wanted to hear something new, you had to plug your player into your PC, run the special program, and then wait while it shoved 64 megs of MP3s through a 200 kilobyte per second parallel port. And USB could have been faster, but you probably didn't have that in 1998, and even if you did, the Rio didn't offer it. Things did improve, obviously. Uh, the second version of the Rio had 64 megs of storage and a USB interface, so it probably ran quite a bit faster, but you still had to sit at your PC and wait to load up an album, no matter how often you listened to it. And that probably stung. So simply using MP3s didn't automatically make these superior portable audio devices. The only thing that was special about them really was that they didn't skip, but contemporary CD players had skip buffers. I had one and it worked great. I mean, unless I was running a jackhammer, which did happen a couple times. And I imagine joggers would benefit from a totally skip proof device. But I think for most people, early MP3 players were just novelties, not really life changing. The iPod, on the other hand, monumental as it was, used a multi-gigabyte hard drive, so it could hold much more than one CD. You could put tons of them on there, in fact, and I think this was key to its success. It wasn't the first device to do this, and we can talk all day about why it succeeded while its predecessors didn't, but the point is it wouldn't have succeeded otherwise. That hard drive allowed it to serve as a complete music library. You didn't just put one album on your iPod, you put dozens on there so you could decide what you wanted to listen to while you were out and about. And that was finally something that CD players couldn't match. I mean, you probably wouldn't bring 10 CDs with you on a jog, not usually, but you could bring 10 albums on your iPod and that was new and exciting. The only question left then was where you were going to get that music to begin with. I mean. Plenty of us know where we were getting our MP3s back then, but if you wanted a legitimate legal option, well, that was complicated. This video isn't a history of online music stores, so I haven't researched this part, but I seem to recall that prior to iTunes, there were a ton of competing vendors that are all pretty much gone now, which probably tells us how well their services worked. Downloading music also cost a lot in both bandwidth and time, especially when most people still had dial-up and many people didn't have internet at all. So in the interregnum, if you will, from about 1998 to 2003, when the iTunes store launched and more people were starting to get broadband, the best way to get MP3s was to rip audio from CDs that you already owned. And tons of people did that, but it required time, hard drive space, a computer new enough to do it, and an understanding of the software none of which were guarantees at the time for a lot more people than now. And finally, while there were a lot of MP3 players available circa 1999 and 2000, they were almost all portable. They were meant to compete in that Walkman space, but what about the person listening on their home hi-fi system who wanted to use MP3s there? 
there wasn't nearly as much hardware being sold towards that use case as far as I can tell. And I think most people assumed you'd just use software on your PC, which you could, but again, not everyone was comfortable with that. And so it wasn't hard in this era to imagine a demographic that wasn't being served. People who wanted to leverage this new media technology, maybe at home as well as on the go, and who maybe even wanted to buy songs online, but couldn't use a PC or the internet to do those things, or at least would prefer not to. And that's who I think Digimedia Media was targeting with this product line. It was originally sold under the name MP3 Go by a company called Memory Corporation, who I think initially marketed them sometime in 1999. Memory Corp lasted a very short time, however, before deciding their business wasn't viable, firing everyone and divesting their consumer products division. That went, along with the CEO, one David Savage, to a new company, which I'm going to continue pronouncing, that's the wrong side, Dig Media. Uh, they rebranded the product from MP3 Go to the uh, less iconic music store. And I think that's pretty much all they changed about it other than the plastic case. So I can't be certain, but I think that whenever we talk about this being sold in 2000, we could assume that it was also being sold in 1999, just with a different look. Anyway, let's see what Dig Media's proposed solution looked like. The box for the music store says that it's a digital jukebox, a CD player, and a web music something. No details on that one. And naturally, given the era, it makes a lot of claims. A revolution in how you manage and enjoy your music. Trust me, that's what it says under all the CompUSA markdown stickers. Uh, and then it says that you can store over 2,000 tracks, uh, links to your existing hi-fi. Uh, you can manage and identify your music via a simple keypad instant track download to your portable soulmate, and it links directly to your PC for quick web music downloads. And of course, over here in the corner, we don't want to forget to explicitly say it's MP3 compatible because that was the biggest buzzword of the era. Finally, uh, in the upper left, we can see the price started out at $450, which was probably less than MSRP, uh, and got marked down to 300 before it sold. And again, the other tags here suggest that this was sold at CompUSA though the markdown suggests it didn't do much selling at all until it hit the bargain bin. Then around on the side, we've got some more claims. It says this is the best of both worlds. Change the way you manage your music. Record and mix from both conventional CDs and from the internet. And then a lot of the rest of this is uh, kind of redundant uh, to what's on the front, except for this bit here, which is curious. Secure MP3 format prevents piracy and makes encoding to MP3 format automatic and secure. Not sure why a consumer would have considered that a feature, but anyway. Now it seems to me this was repacked uh, pretty much like new, so we can see how it shipped. Uh, if we open it up here, we've got the usual suspects. Uh, you've got your AC line cord, uh, you've got a pair of stereo RCAs uh, for audio output, then you've got uh, the typical pair of earbuds. These are made by Koss, and they're in uh, one of these typical 90s retracting winders, um, which just disintegrated when I opened it, which is probably also pretty typical. Uh, and I tried these and they didn't sound half bad, uh, but then the little foam ear pads started disintegrating, so I won't be trying them again. Uh, there's another pair of ear pads in here, but you can bet those are disintegrating too. Then we've just got the manual, uh, and then a registration and a quick start card. Nothing remarkable there. Uh, over here, we've got uh, the driver CD, such as it is. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and then we've got a sample disc uh, from some indie label with a bunch of bands you've never heard of. Um, the Color Red, Stunt Monkey, Acid 9, probably all broke up like three months after this got pressed. Anyway, if we take the top layer out, here's the goods. Uh, this is the music store itself, of course. Uh, that there is the Soulmate. And then we've got the power supply, for the music store. So let's get this all unpacked. And then get all the junk back in the box. So this is the music store itself. And uh, from the box, you could probably suss out a lot of what's going on with it. But in case you've ever seen one of these before, uh, this is what's called a digital jukebox or digital media player. Basically an overgrown MP3 player that's meant to go in your stereo system instead of in your pocket. Uh, it has a five gigabyte hard drive. And the idea is that you load this up with your whole MP3 collection. So you can play anything you want at any time without swapping any media. 
In other words, it's basically a really big iPod, but it's worth keeping in mind that the iPod didn't exist yet, and in fact, the Creative Nomad Jukebox, which Apple basically cloned to create the iPod, as I understand it, probably didn't exist either when this was being designed, and this fact will come up again later. Now, some modern digital media players, and actually a few very early devices uh, made not long after this one, uh, can stream music off your PC directly. And the modern ones can even stream them from internet services. But in this era, you weren't expected to have a network at all. And in fact, you might not even have a PC, which is okay, this works fine without one. You can see that it has a CD-ROM built in, and what you're expected to do is to take the CDs you already have, put them in here, and it will rip them and turn them into MP3s on the internal hard drive. And as I mentioned, you can actually still buy devices that do exactly this, complete with the CD-ROM portion, just nowadays they're usually aimed at the audiophile market and they're pretty pricey, whereas this one was a lot more consumer oriented. Anyway, to illustrate what this is all about, uh, let me plug it in and get some speakers set up. So here's the dream of this device in a nutshell. Suppose it's Y2K and I wanna listen to my friend Jeremy Blake, I mean, to YouTube audio library music he won't compose for another 18 years, but let's not worry about that. I walk up to my stereo, I punch a few keys, and there he is. Do you notice how fast that was? You'd be hard pressed to get an album playing on your stereo that quickly even now. That was probably faster than starting Winamp and dragging an album into it, even including the time it took to power the thing on. Hell, that was faster than finding a CD, opening the jewel case, and putting it in the player. That's pretty damn slick for 2022, let alone 2000, wouldn't you say? We'll go into all the details of how I did that so quickly in a bit, but first let's introduce the little brother. This is, in no uncertain terms, the uh, cheapest, ugliest portable MP3 player I've ever seen. Um, on the other hand, the bar was pretty low at the time, and I think its contemporaries didn't score much better. Still, it's pretty barren feature-wise, and it doesn't feel very good in the hand. Uh, so while it was supposedly sold as a standalone product, I'm not sure anybody ever bought one of these on its merits, which maybe explains why I couldn't find any by themselves on eBay. As an MP3 player, it um, plays MP3s. Here. Yeah, there you go. What makes the Soulmate special is solely its relationship to the music store. The big flap in the middle of it here is a docking port, and you can insert the Soulmate to transfer media directly to it. Because, yeah, if the point here was to make an MP3 library that didn't need a PC, then how would you get those files onto a portable player? The music store wouldn't have drivers for a Rio or a Creative Zen. So the Soulmate, as its name implies, is the perfect partner that DigiMedia created for it. But that of course means that this video is really a review of two separate products. And I'm gonna have to address them one at a time, starting with the music store, since it has the bulk of the functionality. Your first impression will be that this thing feels cheap as hell. They definitely did not go overboard on the quality of the plastic, the molds, or the silver paint. I'm pretty sure this thing got plugged in, tested, and then put right back in the box, because if it had seen any substantial use, I'm sure there'd be worn through patches of off-white plastic all over the thing. The CD-ROM mechanism is uh, one of the uh, pop-top variety, and curiously, uh, while it has a spring assist on the very flimsy hinge back here, the latch in the front lands on a micro-switch underneath here, which is pretty typical. That's what tells the machine if the door is open, but in this case, I'm pretty sure that they're relying on the spring inside that micro switch to uh, pop the door up when you hit the button, which is a uh, pretty poor form, I'd say. Uh, that latch also sticks out quite a bit, so when you open it, it just kind of runs into the edge there, and uh, you have to actually bend the door a little bit. You have to like strain it against the hinges to get it to close, and I'm not sure why they did this, but it sure seems intentional. This thing appears to be in pristine condition, so I guess that's what it's supposed to do? The user interface is entirely through uh, this tiny LCD and the keypad, which is also usually not a sign of great things to come, but you'll see when we power it on, it's really more of a mixed bag and less of a disaster. Much like the top, the back is pretty austere. There's a pair of RCAs to plug into your stereo, a headphone jack, a USB port, and a power input. That's it. Uh, and there aren't any other details on the thing, nothing on the sides 
or the front, uh, except for this IR receiver window. And this is strange, since it didn't come with a remote. There's no mention of one anywhere. Uh, the pictures in the manual don't seem to show this receiver window. So I'm guessing they added this late in production and just never got the remote working. Uh, there's actually even a sensor diode inside. And since remotes were cheap and commonplace in the year 2000, this really seems weird. It's an odd place to just give up, um, especially given how the device is meant to be used. What sort of thing went in your stereo in the year 2000 that didn't have a remote control? The headphone output also doesn't have any kind of volume knob. Uh, now, it's adjusted digitally, which I'm not a big fan of, but they probably did that so you could use the remote, which they never delivered. It could also just been to save money, though, since I'm pretty sure they built this thing down to a price. I mean, they didn't even put the headphone jack on the front where it belongs, so DigiMedia was probably digging in the couch cushions for spare change to get this thing to market at all. Uh, that's probably also why it uses an external AC adapter. The reason manufacturers do this is always the same. They don't want to pay for UL certification to build the power supply into their device. But even the cheapest, crappiest CD players and tape decks shell out for that anyway. So if you have a stereo system, this will probably be the only thing in it with a separate power brick. And even if you don't know what UL is, I think you'd get the message when you notice that everything else you owned just plugged straight into the wall. So at this point, uh, the machine is sadly looking pretty dire already, uh, and it does take a bit to start looking up, even after we turn it on. First, let's talk about sound, and I don't mean what comes out of the RCA jacks. As I mentioned, there's a hard drive in here, and it's not deafening. You probably can't hear it in this audio here. I'm gonna have to amplify some B-roll, uh, but it's not silent either. I can hear it right now. Now, I doubt this thing ran for more than a couple dozen hours tops, so the hard drive bearings should be like new, which means it probably always sounded like it does. And it's not all that loud, but the cheap plastic case doesn't isolate sound at all. So if you're in a quiet room, like, you know, the ideal hi-fi listening setup, there's a good chance that you'll hear it. And since it runs the entire time the unit is powered on, if you can hear it, it's gonna drive you bonkers. The CD player doesn't run all the time, of course, but when it does, it's also quite loud. I don't have a conventional stereo system CD player to compare this to, but I feel like this one's quite a bit noisier than most. When you play a disc, you can really hear it going in there the entire time. It's much louder than the hard drive. And Again, that's probably just because this is encased in thin plastic instead of heavy steel and aluminum. It would really have been nice if they just added a thin sheet of foam rubber or something to mitigate the noise, but I think that might have cost money? Anyway, let's see this do something. The CD player works pretty much like you expect. You pop the top, bend it until the latch pops loose, and then pop a disc onto the spindle here, and then the installation is the reverse of removal. I should point out again that closing this door feels just horrible. If you try and casually shut the lid, it just thwacks into the case until you twist it to the side. It feels like it's put together wrong. Looking at this display is a little cryptic. Um, this is one of those awful hobbyist style like uh, four line LCDs that just does letters, numbers, and it can do custom characters, but they aren't really detailed enough to communicate anything. This kind of display is generally a mark of shame. You only really see it on high-end gear when it's something you're supposed to interact with like a dozen times in the thing's whole lifespan, like putting an IP address on your expensive stereo receiver. That was a dig. As a primary user interface, it's usually bad news. And sure enough, this UI is pretty rough. I'd wager that most people would not be able to use this device casually. Like if you sent somebody over to the stereo and told them to play something, I think they'd come back to you just defeated. You'd have to either read the instructions or want to play a song badly enough to spend 10 minutes running into walls before you can work out the interface. As soon as it's powered on, the music store asks you to enter the name of the music you want. You'd expect to see a menu at this point with artists, albums, and so on, but it actually wants you to search for something, like full text search. You're supposed to use the numeric keypad to enter a query. And 
We'll talk more about that later, but generally when a device only has a keypad, that's not a great sign. Fortunately, there are these soft keys under the display that give us more specific context options, but they aren't as useful as you'd hope. Um, they have these symbols that don't really explain much. The first key, for instance, looks like it might be help, but it's actually Lucky Dip, uh, which is a pretty neat feature, honestly. It shuffles songs from across your whole library or from a specific artist or genre, all of which was pretty much impossible with anything else other than a PC in the year 2000 but I wouldn't say it's worth top billing on the UI. The other two soft keys are just as baffling, and to save you some time, none of them will take you to an iPod-style browse library menu because there isn't one. This device is navigated solely by search, as far as I can tell. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the iPod didn't exist yet, and I don't even think the devices that the iPod cloned existed yet. There was little or nothing on the market that could hold enough music for a library interface to make sense. So let's be real, nobody knew how to do this properly yet. There was no model for this interface, at least not among consumer products. And it's not that surprising that the designers of this device didn't think to mimic the act of thumbing through a CD or vinyl collection. And that was an easy thing to miss. Still, with 2022 hindsight, we can realize that even at the time, it was pretty stupefying to be faced with this, when all you want to do is play some music and you maybe don't know exactly what. If you don't have total recall of your whole music collection, if you're looking for an artist name but you're not sure what it is, you'd be kind of stuck here, short of hitting shuffle and hoping for the best. We'll look more at the library and search features in a bit, but let's follow the workflow here. With this machine fresh out of the box, you'd need to rip a CD to get some music to get started with. So we've got one in there, and of course this can work as an ordinary CD player, and that part is pretty straightforward. All we do is just hit CD, and then there we go. You can press play. and there's your music. And this is a really simple CD player. Uh, you pretty much have pause, play, next track, and that's about it. You can't seek, you can't do program playback, nothing like that. Uh, there are options for shuffle and repeat, but they're just sort of stuffed in here on a numpad button. And uh, you actually can't tell if they're in effect when it's paused. You have to hit play for those to show up. So this really feels like a, a last minute feature. To get to the CD ripping interface, we exit the CD player and then press the soft key with the record symbol. And this is in fact the recording menu, which seems very exciting for a moment. You might think it's for burning a CD from your MP3s and that would be very cool, very ahead of its time. I don't think people typically did that until iTunes came out in 2003, but nothing quite that exciting. Record refers here to ripping a CD. And that seems like a strange use of terminology, but to be fair, most people in the year 2000 probably hadn't ever burned a CD or ripped a CD, and the closest analog to what we're going to do here, to take the contents of the CD and put them onto the device, would be recording, like with a tape. Also, after a fashion, um, this makes a lot more sense than you'd think, even in the context of ripping a CD, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. What is particularly strange is that the mix option shows up here. Now, that really doesn't belong in this menu at all. I'm gonna talk more about mixes later, but just so you understand, in Digimedia's book, a mix is what we now think of as a playlist. So it's just a bunch of tracks on your device that you're playing in a particular order. Now, playlists as a concept were brand new and the vocabulary was probably still in flux in 1999 when this was designed. So I don't bemoan that so much, but I don't know what it's doing here in the record menu. You're not doing any recording. All it does is let you assemble your existing media collection into playlists. And there's a much more intuitive place for it that you'll see later. Just a bizarre choice. Anyway, it tells us how much space is free on the disc still in percentage, which makes sense because this device can record at multiple bit rates. So it can't tell us how many minutes remain and most consumers probably wouldn't want to see the raw megabyte count. So this is the best option available. Anyway, if we want to rip a CD, we press CD. And now we get another kind of confusing interface, at least to me. I never would have figured this out without reading the manual. 
This shows us the list of tracks on the disc. And of course, there's no names for these. Uh, this is before the era of Grace Note, and there's no internet connection for CDDB. And I don't think very many things supported CD text at the time, so the device can't know what disc is in the reader. That's normal. The problem is that this interface sure looks to me like it's asking me to pick one track to rip. And there's no all button, so I was pretty confused here. In reality, if I just hit OK, it'll start ripping the entire disc. This is actually listing the tracks that it's going to capture, and it's offering me a choice. If I don't want to rip an entire disc, I can press this delete key all the way down here at the bottom of the numpad to remove tracks from the list to be ripped. So this is actually a nice interface. This is slicker than it needed to be. But that delete key really needed to be up here under the display, so I associated it with the options on the screen. I never even noticed it was there until I read the manual. Anyway, when we hit OK, it asks us what quality we want to record at. And if you ask me what these options mean, I can't exactly tell you because Digimedia doesn't specify the bit rates anywhere in their documentation and it's impossible to look at the actual files. See, remember when we looked at the side of the box and it said it had secure MP3s that prevented piracy? What they meant is that the MP3s as stored on the disk are encrypted and in fact Digimedia held some patents on that process and sure enough, when I pulled the hard drive out and took a look at what was on it, I found that it had no MBR, no standard file system, and nothing that looked like an MP3 header floating around in the sea of bits on the platter. Their intent, I assume, was to make it impossible to use this device to rip a bunch of disks, then just pull the hard drive out and offload them all. And that's pretty silly for a variety of reasons. Um, for one, I assume the encryption is not particularly robust, but also you'd need a PC to do anything with that hard drive. And if you were that kind of nerd, you'd just have a free CD ripping program anyway. My only guess is that Digimedia did this as a feint. Uh, they were trying not to look like a juicy target for the RIAA, uh, even though their product would never have been anywhere near the top of their hit list to begin with. Uh, for what it's worth, a contemporary article suggests that the bit rates that the Soulmate supported were 96, 122, and 128 kilobits, Pretty typical for the era, and probably those correspond to the SP, LP, and ELP options. So we'll go with that and move on. After we select a quality level, we're asked to enter an artist, and it's finally time to talk about the thing that I've been avoiding so far, text entry. This device is meant to be a complete media library, which means you need to name everything you put in here. It doesn't know the names on the CDs, so you're expected to enter with this little two-line screen and a 10-key numpad, the names of artists, albums, and even tracks, both for ripping discs and searching through music. Now, obviously, that sounds like a gigantic pain in the ass, but in an incredibly year 2000 move, Digimedia licensed T9. If you're under the age of, I don't know, 30, you might not remember T9 at all. In fact, my girlfriend is several years older than me and she doesn't remember it either. But if you were doing a lot of texting or God forbid mobile web surfing in say 2003, you either adored or abhorred T9. See, the normal way of entering text on a cell phone dial pad, for instance, was to press each key repeatedly until you cycled through to the letter or the symbol that you wanted. And the music store can do it this way if you want. So let's see what that looks like. Suppose I'm ripping a system of a down CD. So when I enter system, we have to do seven, four times for an S, and then nine, three times for a Y, and then seven, four times again for an S, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a 15 character name and it takes, I think, over 40 key presses to enter this way. Pretty miserable. The solution to this misery was an extremely early predictive text entry product called T9. The idea is you just press the keys with the letters you want one time for each letter and it applies a dictionary to figure out which words you could have meant and from there it uses weights and grammar analysis to guess at which word you probably meant. So if we go back and turn on T9 again by holding down this key, there it is. To type in system of a down, we just type the letters I want. That was so fast I didn't even need to cut it. This works a lot better than you'd expect. That was a 15 character name and I pressed the keys 15 times. But it did have a couple drawbacks. Um, first off, words had to be in its dictionary. If it wasn't like a normal English word, then you had to fall back to the old press the button repeatedly style of entry. 
Also, as you're typing, the text in the entry field constantly changes to whatever its latest guess is. So it cycles distractingly through a bunch of wildly unrelated words as you type. And finally, if you type out your entire word and T9's final guess is wrong, then you have to press the next word button repeatedly while it cycles through every possible guess. And there's almost never a previous word button. So if you overshoot, you have to go all the way around again. Obviously this system isn't perfect, but it does pretty well with most common English words. And since most music in this thing's target market was probably named with common English words, then this was a decent fit. Of course, if you were listening to a bunch of German industrial or Norwegian black metal, then you were gonna have to enter everything letter by letter anyway. Honestly, as irritating as T9 could be, it was the right choice here. This device, I'm just guessing, was probably not very successful, but without T9, I don't think it ever would have left the drawing board. It would simply be too tedious to use at all. After typing in just one Suvion Stevens track name, even their own testers would have wanted to return the thing to the store. Anyway, after we enter the artist name, it asks us for a title, and that's basically the album name, so we put something in there. Uh, and then it'll ask us for a style or genre. Uh, the list is pretty basic. It's got, you know, usual uh, dance, pop, rock, that sort of thing. And you can edit that from the main menu if you want to add more. And I've already spent more words on the genre feature than you'd ever think this could deserve, right? There's no possible way that it's worth it for me to keep talking, right? This is absurd. What am I doing? It's a genre field. It can't be an important part of the design of the device. What's he still doing? Why is he still talking about it? Well, would you believe me if I told you that the genre feature is going to come up two more times in this video and that it contains an essential playback feature? Mark my words, this thing's a trip. Anyway, with all that agony out of the way, it's, it's actually less than 10 seconds, it's pretty straightforward, uh, we select an option for genre and the ripping process finally starts. And something interesting happens at this point. The music starts playing while it's ripping. After a few seconds, it dawns on you that the only reason this could be happening is if it's ripping the disc at 1x real time and your stomach sinks. That's right. If I want to rip the entirety of the Bare Naked Ladies stunt, I need to let this thing sit there for 51 minutes. And yeah, it's a one-time process. And yeah, I can listen to it while it's ripping if I want, but imagine ingesting your entire CD collection like this. I like to think that they were targeting a pretty casual audience, but still, if you had enough of a collection for the music store to seem worthwhile at all, that had to be at least, what, 30, 40 discs? You were looking at nearly a full work week worth of man hours to feed all those into this thing. Just sitting there waiting for one to finish and then putting the next in and waiting for that to finish. Which seems completely absurd in an era when 32-speed CD-ROMs were cheap and commonplace in just about every PC. Now if you're wondering what happens if you interrupt it partway through the rip, by the way, Yes, you do in fact just get a partial track. It doesn't clean up after itself and it doesn't have any ability to resume an interrupted session. So if you just open the drive by accident halfway through a rip, like I've just done, you're going to have to figure out which track it failed on, manually delete it, then manually restart the rip and manually deselect the tracks that you already have in completion. This is why I said it made sense to call ripping a disc recording because it really is behaving like it's recording it, like a tape deck. And I think I know why it's like this, and we'll talk about that later when we open the machine up. Anyway, once the ripping process is done, you get pitched back to the main menu. And if we want to listen to the music we just ripped, we have to search for it. So I type in Jeremy. And this has actually found the incomplete rip that I just uh, cut off a couple minutes ago. So to get to the complete rip I did the other day, we press the next button here. And if you punched in like a partial artist name, then it would go through everything that matches that search. This I know is the version of the album I ripped in its entirety. So if I hit okay, it lets me either play the album, and it says A there, or I can step through each one of the tracks, uh, hence the T. If I hit play on the album, then it just cues it up and now it works uh, exactly like the CD player does. It's just a very basic um, play, pause, track, forward, back, shuffle, repeat. Uh, there's no seek, no program play, none of that stuff. And there it is. That's most of the functionality. This thing rips discs and it plays them. There are a couple remaining features, but they're fairly trivial. 
Going back to this from earlier, the mix feature allows you to make playlists and it's a little clunky, but it's not too bad given the age. If we go into the record mix here, we can either create a new one uh, or we can edit an existing one. If you make a new one, you just have to name it something and then it'll pop up anywhere as if it was an album. Uh, once you've given it a name, you then search for some music to add and you can either pick uh, an album or you can pick an individual track. You know, it's a playlist. Uh, after you add a track, it asks if you want to add more music to this mix. And every time you want to add another track, you have to answer yes and then restart the search from the beginning, which is a little clunky, but otherwise it works pretty much like you'd expect. Of course, as I mentioned, the mix interface doesn't really belong on the record menu at all. It belongs up here on the scissors menu, which is where you find all of the maintenance stuff. Uh, so for instance, you can go to change names in case you uh, didn't name an album or a track correctly. Uh, and in fact, this is where you have to go if you want to name tracks, because when you rip a disc, they all come in as track one, track two, track three. You have to come in here and manually select each one and rename it. It's very tedious, but I really don't see how they could have solved that. You can also delete music off the device, uh, one album at a time, and this is where you can edit the list of styles or genres. Now you can also merge genres, like if I go down here and pick rock, and uh, I had other songs on here that were tagged with like post-grunge and alt-rock, and I want them all just smooshed together into one set, uh, then I can pick merge and then go pick something and it'll re-tag everything to that one parent genre, which you wouldn't need to do with music you ripped, obviously, right? You'd pick consistent genres, but the music store does allow importing of external MP3s. It's one of its selling points. So if you did have a PC and an internet connection, then you could put your very legally obtained U2 albums on here and those might come in with a bunch of weird genres as was the style of the time. Now about that, you'd think that having a PC interface would be a great asset. Sure, the device is meant to be standalone, but remember there used to be people who did own a PC, they just didn't necessarily have it on all the time. They'd still be willing to hook up their PC to this thing periodically for library maintenance or file transfers. And those seem like really exciting options, right? You could plug it into your PC to see your whole music library, which you can't really do effectively through the LCD. You could build playlists with like a drag and drop interface. You could bulk delete music. Uh, the list of possibilities is endless. And of course, none of it's possible. The PC support is absolutely austere. It's it's like the software you get for programming a microcontroller, except worse because those usually have, you know, an ugly window with a single button that says write file. This, on the other hand, has no interface. I mean it, there's no actual application included with this device. There's just a USB device driver and a plug-in for Music Match Jukebox. If you were around in the early 2000s, you will remember Music Match Jukebox. It was highly divisive, uh, as I recall. I can't tell you exactly why people hated it other than the fact that it was commercial software bundled with just about everything music or audio related for years. If you got any early MP3 player, including some of the iPods in fact, the included disc would try to install Music Match Jukebox on your PC and I think we all just got sick of it being pushed like McAfee. The version included with the music store is just like all the others I've seen. It hasn't been customized in any way. It does the normal music match stuff, uh, which namely is playing songs, building playlists, and ripping CDs. Yes, that's right. The music store, a device which largely exists to rip CDs and play MP3s, includes a program that does both of those things, except with a graphical library, a browsing interface, keyboard and mouse support, and even internet metadata lookup to automatically populate your ID3 tags when you rip a disk. The only real downside was that your computer needed to be on all day if you wanted to use it to listen to music, which was starting to become a pretty normal thing anyway. So maybe we can see some reasons why these jukeboxes never got all that popular. Anyway, once you import some MP3s or rip some CDs, you can select those tracks in the interface and use the send to device option to transfer them to the music store. And there we have it. Not only is this the sole PC interface on display here, but the window title also describes the only thing you can do with it. This dialog lets you confirm which tracks you're sending and send them, that's it. It doesn't show you what's already on the device, only a count of remaining disk space in megabytes. And obviously, since this device is so incredibly anti-piracy, we didn't expect to be able to pull music off of it. But still, 
This doesn't even let you see if you're duplicating data, if you're sending files that are already on the device. Even worse, when you tell it to start the transfer, it asks you to enter an album name, which doesn't make any sense. It should just pull that from the ID3 tags, right? But that doesn't work, and I think it's because the music store doesn't really know what albums are. It understands artists and track titles, but that's it. When you rip a disc, it doesn't really make an album. I think it's just putting all the tracks into a new mix. So when you search for the album title, you're just pulling up the pre-made playlist. There's no actual concept of albums on here. So when you import files for Music Match, not only are you forced to manually punch in a title, but also you can only import one CD at a time. Because think about it, if you select tracks from multiple albums and try and push them all at once, it only asks you for one mix title. So they're all gonna get crushed into one playlist. This is absurd, frankly. It really just, it's the cherry on top of this thing's clunkiness. The PC interface should have solved the problem of bulk imports. For anyone who already has anything ripped on their PC or you know wants to buy a bunch of music online and just dump it onto one of these things, you should be able to select your entire Music Match library and just push it to this device and then go get lunch while it slowly transfers everything at ancient USB 1.1 speeds and come back later and find your whole collection here on the device. But no, if you have 30 CDs that you ripped on your PC, you can't start the process and walk away. You're gonna have to sit there the entire time, babying it, waiting for each transfer to complete before starting the next one by hand, just as if you were ripping the discs on the device itself. And honestly, this is so typical for a Y2K product to have a great concept with heartbreaking UI issues. The box for the music store makes the claim that it can store over a thousand, I'm sorry, over 2,000 tracks, but imagine getting them in there. It's almost like they've gone out of their way to make it as impractical as possible. Fast CD ripping would have made a difference. No dice. Library management from your PC would have made a difference. No dice. Bulk imports from a PC that made sense would have helped, but no dice. Every possible avenue to make this thing less irritating to use as intended has been cut off. I mean, DigiMedia wrote their own custom USB driver for this thing. They had total control. It would have been trivial to add the ability to query the library and edit tags. It would have been trivial to create mixes on the fly as files import. It doesn't matter if it doesn't understand what an album is. Just make them automatically based on the ID3 album field. It's hard to understand how they arrived at these decisions. It seems more obvious to do it the right way. They worked hard to screw this up. So, yeah, this is all pretty depressing stuff, from our perspectives anyway. Let's backpedal a bit. If you're an enthusiast, what I call a full contact user, someone who consumes every part of the electronic animal and lets nothing go to waste, then this is a usability disaster. It's a kind of interesting idea, but it's hampered by a clunky UI, weird data concepts, and inexplicable limitations, plus it's packaged in a cheap, ugly case. As nerds, many of us wouldn't have given this thing the time of day, even when it was new. And if you're an audiophile, forget about it. But if you aren't either of those people, if you don't have golden ears and you aren't trying to index a 120 disc library, if you're an ordinary person who just buys a new pop CD once in a while, who doesn't have stuck up ideas about how things should be designed as long as they work, honestly, this device mostly works. There are certainly things that would make it more appealing to anyone, like a remote control or a library interface that lets you actually browse your media. But if we're honest, this is still pretty cool as is, especially for its time and for its price. $450 seems a little steep, but consider that this product actually had competition and its competition cost a lot more. There were other devices in the market and they had better interfaces. Some even plugged into your TV to offer a graphical library. I haven't been able to find any example pictures of what those looked like, but I'd really love to get one sometime. They could also do higher quality audio and they could store more of it and they were better built and they cost 800 to a thousand dollars or more. They weren't entry level. They weren't for the everyman. They were for gadget freaks, like I would have been at the time if I'd had the money. Early adopters and audiophiles, not people who just wanted their CD library to be a bit more convenient. For that person, this worked remarkably well. Once you had it set up, 
If you wanted to hear an album, you just walked in, typed a couple letters of the name, and hit go. And that is, undeniably, pretty slick for the year 2000, even if you had to do some effort up front to make it work. I think this is the right perspective to have, and Dig Media CEO David Savage seemed to agree. His various press releases strongly suggested that he was focused on that everyman. Uh, for instance, uh, this quote regarding online music sales, the record companies think that the label is the brand, but most people don't know what label the bands on their CDs are from. Consumers just want the music. Clearly, he was interested in that demographic that didn't know much more about music than how it sounded, and he was probably on the right track, pun fully intended. I wrote it in the script, how can it not be intended? Now that quote I should mention was about another product they were offering called the Internet Audio Port. Yes, they really called it that. And that was the third product that I mentioned at the beginning, the one that I'll never find, but that filled in the last part of this ecosystem. And I'll only cover that briefly since there isn't a lot of info available. I have to speculate on some of this. From what I can tell, it seems like it was a device with an ethernet port that you plugged into broadband internet service. And then you could use a touch screen to buy or at least download music from quote, the user's favorite online music store. A possibly inaccurate magazine review also claims that you could have it then transfer those downloads directly to the music store. That is the, the Dig Media product, this, not the generic concept of a music store that I used in the previous sentence. So that's the complete package, right? If you had all that, then the audio port would help you get MP3s, the music store would store and let you listen to them at home, and the Soulmate would then let you take your purchased music with you. Now that assumed that other companies would partner with Dig Music to offer support for this thing, and I doubt that initiative ever could have gotten off the ground. And it required you to have broadband in the year 2000, but presumably not be a PC enthusiast already, which was probably not very likely. But Assuming somehow this had worked out, we could have ended up with the fascinating situation of a bunch of people with massive MP3 collections, broadband internet connections, and no computers, which I think we can all agree would have been deliciously weird. We really missed out on something special here. So anyway, let's take a look at the Soulmate now and see what that notional weirdo's mobile experience would have been like. Now, I will be frank with you once again. This is the cheapest MP3 player I have ever personally handled. It's not the smallest, but it's definitely the cheapest. This has a plastic belt clip and it's not even, wow, you know what? I, I hadn't actually tried bending that before. This is going to snap the first time that you put it on your belt. This, this isn't even real. Wow, that is incredible. That sucks unbelievably. It also runs on AA batteries, uh, but that wasn't unusual for the time. I actually had a number of MP3 players that ran on those as well. Uh, but they do live in this little pack that you have to unscrew. Like you actually have to get a screwdriver. See, you can't really quite do it with your fingers. There we go, that did it. So they live in this little pack here and it's got this little, little cavity down here that looks like it might contain charging circuitry or something like that, but it's actually almost empty. There's just a little circuit board in there with a bypass for the DC power jack because for some reason, oh, it's really hard to get this plug out because it's, it's not rubber like it should be. It's made out of some awful plastic. Also, hmm, I guess that just came out. Anyway, uh, this has a DC jack, so you could actually run this thing off an AC adapter for some reason. I'm not sure why you would do that, but I guess you could if you wanted. The build quality has the same general cheapness as the music store, uh, the same flimsy plastic and silver paint, uh, and the LCD is a conventional type. You know, it's not a dot matrix. It's just got a couple sets of fixed digits. So we've got the track number here and the current playback position. Uh, and then for things like repeat or shuffle, it's got uh, predetermined shapes. So if I press the feature button here, we've got EQ, repeat, uh, shuffle, uh, and then we've got a scan and an erase feature. Curiously, I'm not sure why you'd wanna do that. Uh, and then uh, if you select the battery icon, that's how you turn it off. There's no backlight on it and the buttons are the mushiest rubber you've ever felt in your life. And besides the repeat and shuffle, it's got the same controls as the music store. Play, pause, next previous track, and a volume control. You can't seek within a song and you can only skip between tracks. 
And that's pretty much it. That's all this thing does. It's one of the simplest MP3 players I've ever seen, um, probably on par with a Rio. I've never actually owned one, so I'm not sure. But you know, it plays tracks. What else is it supposed to do? But the equalizer setting, that's interesting. I mentioned that you can turn on EQ, but there's no interface for configuring it. And by default, it just acts as bass boost. Uh, there's no option to adjust it on the device itself. And that could be that. There were devices that just had bass boost and nothing else. But this one has a little more going on. Uh, if you bought the Soulmate by itself, it came with either a parallel or a USB interface cable. And you could hook it up to your PC to load files or run a program to set the EQ. It only has bass and treble sliders, but you know, at least it's there. So you can change it from a bass boost to a treble boost if that's what you want to do. But the combo kit doesn't seem to come with this cable, so you can't configure it from your PC. You can, however, set the EQ from the music store, but in the weirdest imaginable way. Guess what? We're talking about genres again. If I go in to edit genres, sorry, change styles, and I edit blues, I can rename it, I can merge it, or I can set the equalization settings, and there's bass and treble. They are tied to genres. So if you want to bass boost one track but not another, you're going to have to create separate genres to put them in, which is probably why this calls them styles instead of genres. The even wilder thing is that these settings don't even apply to the music store itself. They don't do anything on here. They only take effect when the songs are transferred to the soulmate. Yeah, this is a very strange solution to put it mildly. But to be fair, there's also nowhere on the device to put these EQ settings. The screen doesn't have room for them, so I guess they did what they could. Um, and of course, the screen also shows no track information, no artist, uh, no album, no library view, nothing like that. And that all makes sense because like most contemporary MP3 players, this has very little capacity. Uh, it's not clear from the documentation exactly how much storage this has, but uh, various press releases suggest that it's 48 megs, uh, although it may have been improved uh, in a later release to 64 megs, if that ever came out. Now, to its credit, that is more capacity than the Rio had, but that was also two years older, and that one could be expanded while this one can't. At 128 kilobits per second, the Soulmate can store about an hour of music, which isn't all that bad, but it does mean that by itself, it is, once again, just an inferior replacement for a CD player. Combined with the music store, however, it actually has some value. As I mentioned, this flap in the middle of the music store hides the docking port for the Soulmate. And of course, the Soulmate has a mating connector on the side under an absolutely detestable cover. This should be made out of some kind of rubber, uh, it should have a little tab on it, but instead it's some kind of plastic and it's got nothing you can get a grip on. So it's almost impossible to pull this out without like a screwdriver to pick at it with. Even then, uh, it just sticks in the hole and then once it's out, it just kind of dangles from this little tether uh, and the plug turns out to be this extremely fat board edge connector like you'd see on like an Atari 2600 game cartridge. Anyway, uh, to dock the player, you have to hold this awful little thing up out of the way, and then you drop it into the slot and just kind of uh, wiggle it because there's no way to nail it on the first try. The tolerances here are just awful. So you just have to kind of jiggle it and eventually it'll seat into place. Uh, in fact, I've crashed the music store while plugging this in about six times, and I'm guessing that's because the port gets, you know, cross-threaded and shorts out the CPU data bus. So that sucks. Anyway, once it's docked, the right soft key turns into this arrow, and that puts you in transfer mode. Uh, you get the search interface again, and you can select, you know, either a uh, entire album or a mix or a track, just like normal, uh, and then just press the button to send it over to the device. Uh, now, if you do try and send multiple tracks at once and it's too much to fit on the device, it informs you with this extremely comical music too long message. Uh, now, a lesser device would just error out at this point. Too much, can't do it. Uh, but here you can either hit fill, which will copy tracks until the device is out of space, or you can step through the list and delete tracks one at a time until it says music 
fits. Uh, this is actually a really nice feature. Like I said, they didn't need to actually do this. They could have just said, eh, too bad, and you have to go back and make a mix that's smaller than the device. Of course, it's only a nice feature if you know it's there. I had to read the manual because it was just not obvious to me from this interface that I could do that. Once you have it whittled down, just hit transfer and everything will start pushing to the device. Then once it's done, you can just pop the Soulmate out and take it with you. That works as you'd expect, but something interesting happens now if we try and play that album on the music store. Because this thing is so concerned with preventing piracy, it actually applies DRM measures here. So once you send a song to a soulmate, it becomes locked and you can't play it on the music store or transfer it to another soulmate. So it behaves as if you only have one physical copy of the song that can only be played in one place at a time which is exactly what the RIA has always wanted. To unlock a track, you have to plug the Soulmate back in and let the music store wipe the entire device. You can't do it one track at a time. Uh, and this illustrates what a poor choice this device's name was because the message it prints is, do you wish to erase the Soulmate? They could not possibly have made that more awkward. Yes, erasing Soulmate. DRM aside, the way these work together is actually pretty slick. You drop in the player, type in what you want, hit the button, and it's on there. And it's not just convenient, it's fast, too. In fact, uh, the speed at which this transfers made a real mess of things when I first tried to shoot this video. The manual claims that it could take 20 seconds to transfer 60 minutes of music to this thing, and that would be absurdly fast for this era. By my math, that's about 2.4 megabytes per second, or a lot faster than contemporary flash memory should have been. So I wrote a script about how shockingly fast this was, but while I was shooting it, I got suspicious and I timed it out myself and found out that it's more like 30 seconds. That's only about 1.6 megabytes per second, which isn't as fast as I thought. And I'm pretty sure that Dig Media was talking about 60 minutes of low bitrate music, so it wasn't actually filling the entire device. But even so, this still seemed curiously quick. I couldn't find firm numbers on how fast typical consumer flash memory was in this era, but as far as I can tell, this is on par with some of the most expensive compact flash cards that were being sold at that time. 10 or 12 speed models that Lexar was selling to professional photographers. It doesn't make sense that this ultra cheap MP3 player would have something that good inside. In fact, I dug up and benchmarked a 32 meg smart media card for comparison figured that was about typical for a consumer memory card at the time, and the best figure it could produce for write speed was about 0.4 megabytes per second, which sounds a lot more likely. Now, it could be the card reader at fault here. I admit that I don't remember how close USB 1.1 got to its claimed 12 megabit throughput in practice. So maybe that's the problem. And in fact, the manual for the music store has estimates for how long it would take to fill the Soulmate up from your PC directly. And while the parallel port estimate is unsurprisingly comical, a whole 20 minutes, they also claim that USB would take three minutes. That's only around 250 kilobytes per second, which is a far cry from 12 megabits. Now I'm sure that the music store and the Soulmate use a proprietary high-speed interface that wouldn't be affected by any bottlenecks in a generic interface like USB. So maybe that's all there is to it, but still that write speed feels curiously fast for a cheap consumer product. And besides that, there's one other quirk in this device that really made me suspicious that something odd was going on inside. For the most part, the Soulmate is a boring but functional MP3 player doesn't have any real problems, except for one. If the batteries run dry, all the music on it disappears. I'll show you. I have 14 tracks on this device right now. There we go, obviously I have music on here. Now, let's take the battery out, and then put it back in. Zero tracks, they're all gone. Now, there's only one real explanation for this. I know some of you are gasping right now. It's a really, really weird explanation, and I can't be certain I'm right about it, but I think I am. I'm gonna open this up and show you what's inside. Uh, maybe someone can verify this in the comments, uh, but I will say first though, if you're wondering, 
uh, this doesn't screw you over regarding the DRM. Um, all your transferred songs are locked to a key that's baked into the player hardware. So even if this thing gets wiped, when you dock it, it'll still unlock everything on the music store. So anyway, let's crack this thing open. The battery pack comes out first, and uh, now we know why it's screwed in instead of using a tab like every other consumer device. If the batteries fell out by accident, you'd lose all your songs, so they didn't want to take any risks. The rest of this comes apart with just four screws, and then the two halves of the case pull apart, uh, and this is more of that weird flexible plastic stuff, not rubber, so I wouldn't take this thing out in the rain. Inside, we've got a pretty typical setup. Uh, we've got a single board, fairly densely packed on both sides. On this side, we've got the LCD. Uh, this is the PIC microcontroller, basically the CPU of the whole device. And on the flip side, we've got these two chips here that are doing most of the work. Uh, they're labeled Micronas, Micronus, something like that. Uh, one of them is labeled a DAC 3550A, that's a uh, digital to analog audio converter, uh, and the other is a MASS 3507D, which is an integrated MP3 decoder. Uh, we can make some safe assumptions here. Microcontrollers of this era weren't fast enough to decode MP3, so we can guess that the PIC chip just handles user input and controls the LCD, and then it spends the rest of its time just grabbing MP3 data out of storage, which is uh, these three chips here, uh, and sending it to the decoder, which then sends it to the DAC. That would make this just about the simplest possible MP3 player design. So the only question remaining is what kind of chips actually are these? Now in a typical device, these would each be 16 meg NAND flash modules, but flash doesn't lose its contents when you power it off. So I doubt that. These are also IBM branded and I'm pretty sure IBM never had a flash memory division. So although Google can't turn up any results about these part numbers, Given the behavior, I feel pretty certain that these are static RAM chips. Static RAM, or SRAM, is similar to the dynamic RAM, or DRAM, that we use in our PCs today. Now, DRAM is extremely fast, but it's volatile, meaning that if you don't constantly refresh the contents of your memory, uh, they'll just evaporate. Static RAM is very similar, and it was actually used in a few PCs well up into the 386 era. It's still pretty fast, and it's still volatile, but there's an important difference. All it needs to keep the contents of memory alive is a continuous supply of DC power. It doesn't require any complex refresh circuitry. So if you write some MP3s to these chips and then just keep them powered, you can read those files back anytime you want. And it seems absurd to use SRAM like this, but hey, this is how your Zelda NES cartridge saved your games. It wrote them to a battery powered SRAM chip. And some of those chips are still running three decades later. In fact, the uh, Soulmate can supposedly idle on a set of AAAs for about two weeks, or longer if there's nothing on it. The battery life in the manual actually says two weeks with content, three weeks without, because if it's empty, well, there's no reason to keep the RAM alive. It's not storing anything. So the pick powers it down to save battery life. And if you keep it on the dock when you're not using it, it'll last even longer since the dock powers the RAM directly. Okay, so literally, as I was about to hit render on the final release of this video, one of my patrons found the data sheet for the RAM modules. I'd searched for it over and over and never found it, but somehow they dug it up, and it turns out that it's not static RAM after all. It's SDRAM, just like what we were using in PCs at the time. Um, but this isn't really a disappointment because it's still pretty weird stuff. Normally, you need a dedicated controller to handle the refresh process for DRAM. I was pretty sure a PIC couldn't handle that, or at least you wouldn't want to rely on it. And I was also pretty sure that it would pull too much power to leave that PIC constantly running when in standby. So since I didn't see a memory controller, I didn't even consider DRAM as a possibility. But it turns out that these particular modules support a power saving mode in which they can be told to refresh their own contents without an external controller. So functionally, they might as well be static RAM because you only need to provide constant DC power to maintain their contents. And since the internal circuitry is doing the bare minimum to keep them refreshed, you save a ton of power versus any external solution. Now, I don't know if this is a common feature in DRAM, but I certainly didn't expect it. And effectively, everything else I'm about to say still applies. I just wanted full disclosure. Now, it is 
extremely funny to me that this company made a media player that runs down its batteries faster if there's music on it. But it also makes a lot of sense. This was probably cheaper than flash memory and it works fine for the use case it's intended for. You don't need it to last years in storage when the expectation is that the user is gonna wipe and reload it probably every single day. And since the capacity is so small, losing everything when it runs out of power isn't a big deal. You can just reload it. And it's even less of a problem because reloading the thing takes so little time. And that's probably a big motivator here. I suspect the Soulmate was the fastest transferring MP3 player of its time when used with the music store because the mothership here could just dump data straight into the RAM chips basically as fast as it can load it off the hard drive. And that speed made this incredibly convenient compared to the competition, at least I think so, not exactly dank pods. I haven't looked at a thousand other MP3 players, but with all my belly aching about those MP3 players with tiny storage, forcing you to make your music decisions before leaving the house, well, this one might not solve that problem, but it at least lets you do it in a matter of seconds instead of minutes and without having to mess with your PC. Even if you're ready to walk out the door when you realize you've forgotten to reload your player, you can just plug it into this thing, punch up a Stabbing Westward album, hit transfer, and half a minute later, you're ready to go. It's almost as fast as grabbing a CD. And I think that's what Digimedia Media thought would make this stand out. If you can't store more than one disc, at least make exchanging that proverbial disc really, really fast. The only real downside to the solution is the fact that you can't change the batteries. I certainly remember taking my CD and tape players with me all over the place and bringing a pair of double A's, which I ended up needing not infrequently. But if this runs down while you're jogging, well, you're out of luck. All the spare batteries in the world won't bring your music back. So once again, this compares poorly to a CD player. But it's also possible that this limitation wasn't supposed to be this bad. On both sides of this board, there's these little metal cans that look like lithium button cells. That's what I thought they were at first, especially since they each metered out at less than a volt, which would make sense for 22 year old batteries of this size. But I realized I was wrong. These are silk screened SC and they're stamped Elna 3.3 volt and 0.22 something. Now that unit symbol is hidden behind a lead, but I'm betting that it's 0.22 farads. These are clearly super capacitors, uh, capacitors with unusually high energy density. And nowadays they get used for all sorts of things. They're almost like uh, low capacity batteries. But I didn't know they were even around in the year 2000. Now this is a total guess, but I feel like the Soulmate might have been one of the earliest consumer products to contain one. Now my assumption is that they're meant to solve this problem. They're supposed to charge off the batteries since supercaps uh, charge nearly instantly. And then they could provide a few seconds of life to the SRAM, just enough for a grace period for you to swap the cells without losing all your music. But if that was the plan, it doesn't seem to work. As you saw, the player blanks out pretty much instantly as soon as you remove the batteries. So maybe these have failed uh, or they don't do what I think, but I'm not sure what else they could be for, and I'd like to imagine the Dig Media at least tried to solve this problem because it's a real doozy. At any rate, uh, having laid bare the mysteries of the Soulmate, I think it's only fair that we open up the music store as well. It's not quite as unusual, but it will give us an answer to an important question. Why is the CD ripping process so slow? This unit comes apart with uh, six screws driven into the plastic. And when opening it up, you need to be careful not to tear the little Mylar ribbon cable connecting to the LCD. And then this metal shield just lifts right off and there's most of the device. Several of the chips are under this 4200 RPM hard drive. Uh, so I've unscrewed the CD-ROM transport so we can flip the motherboard up here. And now we can slip that hard drive out. Now this CD-ROM mechanism is a kind of an unusual thing. I think it might have been sold as an industrial module because it's really neither here nor there. It's got the spring-loaded spindle that you pop the disc on like you'd find on a portable CD player, but then it has a native 40-pin IDE data interface and a PC-style 4-pin Molex connector. So I thought for a minute this might be like a gutted PC CD-ROM, but then it wouldn't have the spring-loaded spindle and I don't think it would have all these headers down the side. 
there's this whole row of unlabeled pin headers down the side instead of on the back where you'd expect them on a, a PC CD-ROM. And at least one of them, I'm pretty confident, is analog audio output because that's the exact same plug you see on every PC CD-ROM drive. Uh, but the uh, blue wire here, for instance, is for the lid switch. Uh, that's the uh, micro switch over here uh, that tells it when the, the door is open. And that switch actually goes into the main board here uh, so it could tell the uh, processor whether the door is open and then the signal passes through uh, to the CD-ROM mechanism so as soon as you open it, it can immediately stop playing. There's only one other connection here, which is this guy, and that is digital audio. I scoped it to be sure, it's definitely digital, and I'm not sure which protocol it is, but I suspect it's SpeedIF, uh, since most PC CD-ROMs have that as an output option, and also because the uh, CS 8412 chip over here is an AES and SpeedIF decoder, so it seems likely. At any rate, it does output audio, uh, and that's what makes this device so weird, I suspect. The CD-ROM may connect to the motherboard via what appears to be an IDE interface, but it doesn't send audio over that, and um, we can actually prove this. Let me plug it back in. And now I'm just gonna unplug that little red wire. Oops. Oops. There goes the sound. And then if I plug it back in, it picks right back up. I'm no expert in reverse engineering, but I think I understand what's going on here. See, Every CD-ROM has the built-in ability to play CD audio. And in fact, uh, some PC drives back in the day even had play buttons and headphone jacks built in. And if you just plugged one of those into power with no data connection, you could use it as a standalone CD player. And for much of history, when you played a CD in your PC, all that happened is your machine told the drive to seek to a particular track and start playing, and then the drive circuitry took care of the rest. It decoded the CD audio, converted it to analog, piped that analog signal to your sound card, which relayed it to your speakers, and that was that. Your computer had nothing to do with the playback process once it started. And the same is true with this device. It does have this IDE interface, but that's only used to send play, pause, and change track commands. It doesn't handle any of the audio data. That all runs over the SpeedIF digital output. So I'm gonna take a look at the chips on the board here, and I'll take a stab at how they handle that output. The major players are this chip labeled ARM SEC N950, which I can't look up, uh, but it might be a CPU. Maybe that's what the ARM part means. There's a Motorola digital signal processor, an Actel FPGA. We have the SpeedIF audio decoder here, then a digital analog converter and an amplifier chip, as well as about five megs of onboard RAM. Since I don't see a dedicated MP3 decoder chip here like we saw in the Soulmate, I'm assuming that the MP3 functionality is in the FPGA, and when you rip a disc, it probably works something like this. The CPU tells the CD-ROM to start playing a track. Once it starts, audio begins flowing to the SpeedIF decoder, which starts outputting serial audio samples to the FPGA, where they get compressed to MP3 and written to RAM. Meanwhile, the CPU grabs the compressed samples as they're deposited and writes them out to the hard drive. Meanwhile, the FPGA splits off the samples and forwards them to the DAC, which then outputs them through the RCA jacks and then through the amplifier to the headphone jack. And of course, if you're just playing a CD, it skips the compression step. And if you're playing an MP3, this all happens in reverse. Uh, the CPU copies samples off the hard drive to RAM, and then the FPGA loads them, decodes them, and the rest is the same. Now this all seems plausible to me, except that I've left out this big digital signal processor chip. I'm not sure what that's here for, since there's no audio processing options, uh, there's not even a basic equalizer. So my best guess is that this is converting between sample formats. Like maybe the FPGA uh, sends every sample from the SpeedIF decoder over to the DSP to have it bit crushed or expanded or swap the, you know, the significant bit or something. And there could be other problems with my order of operations here, but I'm pretty sure I have the basics right. And either way, this is the answer to our question. The music store rips CDs at 1X because it's not really acting like a computer. It's not copying the audio off the disc as blocks of data. Instead, this is more like 
plugging a tape recorder into the output on a CD player and just hitting record. I mean, sure, it's digital rather than analog, and it uses the IDE interface to recognize when a track ends so it can start recording to a new file. Those things make it cleaner than the typical analog hole approach, but otherwise it's just slurping the sound off the aux jack, as it were. Now, I'm gonna be honest here, this is a bit above my head, all right? I don't actually know if they could have improved on this situation, and I don't fully understand how CD audio works. I do know that the option to play music in real time over an IDE interface, a technique that's apparently called digital audio extraction, was notoriously flaky for many years. I never managed to get it working up until probably the late 2000s. I also learned while researching this video that even Music Match Jukebox, at least in this era, didn't enable that by default. Apparently it just wasn't very reliable. Instead, it committed even worse crimes than this thing does. The music store, to its credit, does at least record from a digital audio stream. Presumably the speed of output is lossless. Not that it counts for much since it immediately gets crushed to 128 kilobits, but it's trying. Music Match, however, by default, also rips at one speed, and it captures the CD's output through your sound card's analog audio input. And from what I've read, this was often the only option available. Some drives just would not output digital audio at all. So despite my blustering earlier about how inferior this is to just ripping your CDs on your PC with free software, unless you were lucky enough to have the right hardware, the results from the music store technically used a purer signal path. So maybe the digital audio extraction technique just wasn't mature enough to use in the year 2000 and DigiMedia really did their best here. Or maybe the CPU, RAM, and hard drive they chose weren't fast enough to handle a high-speed CD-ROM data stream. So they had to punt and work with off-the-shelf chips that only functioned at 1x. Either one seems possible and I'll never know the answer. Though I will know that the hard drive doesn't play a part. Why did I write that? Obviously this can record faster than that. What is wrong with me? But this is one of several problems with the music store that feel more like artifacts of the time than mistakes on the part of the designers. Oh, don't get me wrong, this system is cheap, crappy, and awkward, but when all said and done, I'm not sure they could have designed it that much better for the price. I just think they should have raised the price a bit. I think there was a low to mid-range consumer market that would have appreciated this thing if it was a little faster, a little better built, had a better interface, and a higher capacity portable player. Basically, if it cost $550 instead of $450, it probably would have seen more success. On the one hand, I strongly suspect this is the only product of its type that was ever stocked in retail stores. Uh, the price point and the feature set of all the contemporary devices I've found all seem like things you would have mail ordered. Well, this is very much an impulse buy kind of product. But on the other hand, I think we can see how the buyer of this specimen felt about it. They got the box home, opened it, grimaced, tried the device out for a few minutes, and then put it back in the box, only to find out CompUSA wouldn't take a return on a clearance item, at which point they stuck it in the attic for the next two decades. I think Dig Media wanted to sell this to average Joes, but they aimed too low, not realizing that the very basic consumer they were targeting wouldn't be willing to shell out $450 for something so confusing and tedious, the slightly more dedicated listener wouldn't be willing to shell out $450 for something so basic, and the serious music enjoyer wouldn't be willing to buy something with such poor audio quality when they could spend twice as much on something that could do 160 to 320 kilobit MP3. Now, another angle entirely is my girlfriend's take, that this wasn't for any kind of average person at all, that it was really something you were expected to buy for your teenage kid. That's a fair point, and in fact, the box art, somewhere on here, there we go. There's a kid, I think. Okay, maybe that is the case. But something about it doesn't quite ring true to me. It seems a bit too much to stick on Ferris Bueller's dresser, but maybe I'm overthinking it. Market speculation aside, what's really intriguing to me is that despite the onwards march of technology, you could use this today and it would work exactly as well as it ever did. 
If you're one of those people who can't hear the differences in 128 kilobit MP3, then this is a perfectly viable digital audio player for your hi-fi system. And despite my mildly ragging on the UI, even that has some advantages. It's very stripped down and it's very responsive. And the universal alphanumeric search feature means that it's actually much faster to find music on this than most other devices of its type that I'm aware of. For a 22 year old product, that's pretty impressive. So. I suspect that this is another victim of the Y2K uncertain future problem, where companies in the early 2000s just didn't know what was coming or who the market really was. Maybe this thing flopped just because PCs became popular so quickly that it became moot. People were okay with just playing all their music off their PC. They anticipated a pickiness that didn't actually exist. But we'll never know, and at this point, that's all I've gotta say about it. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to my channel so I know you're into this sort of thing. Remember to turn on notifications if you wanna find out when I upload new stuff, since I'm kinda back on a regular schedule these days. If you really like this, however, consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. I couldn't do what I do without their help, uh, because this device may have only set me back $20 today, but in another reality, I would have bought one from the UK on eBay for $400, and I can't afford that kind of lark without the support of viewers like you. I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's keeping the lights on here. Thank you all so much, and to everyone else, thanks for watching.